Welcome back from the break. This is from the floor segment. I'm sitting down with the chairman of arguably the most powerful committee of parliament. That's the finance committee of parliament. We'll have a discussion over a wide range of issues and then zero in on government's financial plan to mitigate the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the economy as well as other interesting uh, matters. I'm here with the Honourable Member of Parliament for New Jobbing South, Chairman of the Finance Committee of Parliament, Mark Esibeya Boa, PhD. Welcome, sir. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, so just, just to uh, get things very clear and help my audience understand, what is the work of the Finance Committee of Parliament? Yeah, so our orders uh, provide uh, in order 169 that uh, the Committee on Finance shall be the committee to which all matters relating to the economy okay. would be uh, referred to and considered. So um, if you tie the Constitution to our standing orders, then financial matters, matters relating to the economy, as per Article 181, the contraction of loans all of it will be matters that the finance committee handles. So, and pretty much everything relates to the economy. That's why the finance committee would do about 75% of the work on the floor. Yeah, so um, uh, we are quite busy uh, at the finance committee. The people have spoken about the kind of scrutiny that goes into, I mean, the approval and even the recommendations regarding uh, the various loans and commercial agreements and other things that financial agreements that come to the floor from from the committee some have said that we take too little time to look at these documents uh, the house is saddled with a lot of the i mean in the last three days i can count on the tip of my finger over 25 loan agreements that have come onto the floor financing and loan agreements tell us what level of scrutiny goes into these you know, agreements before they are, they are passed. It's a real source of worry for oh, me. You see, um, most of them we, we've done over and over again. Mm -hmm. If we, you have, say, a World Bank ID loan facility, the terms are concessionary, okay. they are standard terms, and you, you don't really uh, have to do anything extraordinary to get it passed okay so those will be id world bank loans we've also we, all, we have african development bank loans which are also standard then we have um, um, commercial facility some of them the loans that you see you count them 25 sometimes there are three different facilities for one project I see. so there will be uh, an oekb facility for exam example of which, which finances the project to the tune of 85 percent, then normally government would have to provide counterpart. Counterpart. But then government says, well, I'm going to borrow because if I don't have the money, it's going to delay the process. So government borrows again for the same project. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there are three different facilities for one loan. That's why when we are moving the motions, we would combine them and say that we are moving motions, say seven, eight, and 10, because the same report. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we, the sources of the, of, the, of the loans are standard, and we've done these over and over again, and maybe we have perfected the act of approving loans. There's also a concern about tax waivers and how much could have accrued to the state PT if, not we, if, if we are not granted these waivers to some of these companies. Most of them are worked on by a committee as well. Yes, uh, it's a constitutional provision again. 1742 of the constitution says this parliament that shall uh, waive taxes. So nobody in this country has that power to do so. And most commercial contracts that come to parliament approved by the sector committees have clauses in there that says the project be exempted from uh, duties and taxes. So we, are, we only give meaning to what is in the commercial contracts. Uh, they, they come to us and if you didn't waive the taxes, it adds on to the um, contract price. So if it's a $174 million contract and the duties there of uh, 20, uh, 26 million, you choose to either waive it or add it to the contract sum. Okay. And if you add it to the contract sum, 
the financing costs, everything also also go up. So these things are not going to end. If we had our own money and we're building a project, which we do, if we are building from a, a, a school with get fund, funds from get fund, the contractors that do these projects, they pay taxes and duties. These are our own funds. But if somebody is sourcing funds from somewhere, the one who the lender says, I don't want you to use some of these funds for the payment of duties and taxes. If the country insists, then they are going to add it to the cost. To the cost. So yeah, the, that's what we have been doing. So yes. All right, let's let's come to this. I mean, the coronavirus pandemic. It's, it's I mean, taking its toll on the world economy. The IMF World Bank if it continues, and they are predicting the contraction of many economies. Many economies may go even into recession. And, and um, finance minister this week was in parliament to brief the house on the economic impact. Personally, observing and I mean, looking around, what does this mean for our economy? Yeah, uh, um, the the consequences uh, could be dire. Mm. If you drive around town, there is pretty much little economic activity going on. Our country depends a lot on our exports. Now, the destinations of our exports are in lockdowns, so uh, a lot of our goods are, are not needed in, in these times. If even they are needed, there's no economic activity in those countries. We are also import dependent. We import a lot of essential drugs, uh, food and what have you. So then again, all those in import businesses, what do they do? So just uh, back of the envelope calculation, you are going to lose some 5% uh, of GDP. Without it, billion. Yes. And if this is wiped off. It could go into negative. Now, two quarters of negative growth will be a recession. And it's, it's been predicted all over. Because of the experiences during the Great Depression of the 30s and the Great Recession of 2008, now central banks and ministries of finance are proactive. Immediately they see signs they want to stimulate the economy so that there's not a complete um, uh, decline in economic activity. But we are just maybe what ten days into this lockdown mm -hmm. in Accra and Kumasi alone. And if you look at uh, the hotel industry, the airline industry, the restaurant, uh, food industry, services, if you even want to get a haircut, I'm sure okay. you, you, you will struggle. So, with all the informal actors in our economy, the painter, the plumber, the electrician, the steel bender. All of them are home in our big cities, Accra and Kumase. So there's going to be um, a, 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 a slowing down of economic activity. And the economy, excuse my French, it could tank. Mm -hmm. These are serious times. And nobody can really have a handle on it to predict uh, where we are going to. But these are, uh, these are challenging times for the economy. For, a small open economy like ours, um, the economy could um, suffer seriously. The same statement proposed some 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 measures. Uh, for instance, the coronavirus alleviation program. Um, the president um, asked for, for about a billion cities to be to to be dedicated into that that, that fund, which will be coming from the stabilization fund. Um, other measures were also mentioned going into the, the, the central bank having to lower some of its, um, you know, projections and permutations. There's also the talk of the heritage fund, but we'll, we'll, we'll come to that. Let's first look at the stabilization fund, going into the stabilization fund. What at all is the stabilization fund? So, um, uh, oil revenue, you know, uh, the Petroleum Revenue Management Act that regulates the uh, usage of our petroleum revenues. Uh, says that uh, every year when you take out the portion that goes to the National Oil Company, GMPC, the rest, there's a formula. 70% of it goes into the, what we call the ABFA, Annual Budget Fund Amount. The remaining 30%, we have what we call a stabilization fund, and then we have the heritage fund. 21% goes into the stabilization fund and 9% into the heritage fund. The heritage fund, the law says that you cannot touch it 
until 15 years has passed. And in the 15th year, Parliament, by a resolution of a majority, will decide what you want to use the interest on the stabilization. The yeah, the interest on the heritage fund for after 15 years, because the essence is that um, the oil revenues would, the uh, oil resource would deplete at some point, and so future generations must also benefit from it. So let's save this for some rainy day in the future. So that's the heritage. Now, on, on the stabilization fund, the law says that the minister shall place a cap. So the minister, in presenting the annual budget, proposes a cap that will be placed on the stabilization fund. That is how much goes into the stabilization fund. This year, the minister placed a cap of 300 million. And this cap is on, annual, is on an annual basis? Yes. Okay. So this year, the cap on the stabilization fund was 300 million. So that when monies, because we projected oil revenue, uh, crude oil price of 62 average per barrel. Now we are around 22 or something. Yeah. So if you get the 300 million in the stabilization uh, fund, the rest goes into a contingency fund, which con contingency fund shall be used for debt repayment. Okay. That's what the law says. What the minister seeks to do now is to lower the cap. So now the minister is saying, I want to lower the cap from $300 million to $100 million. So to, to suggest that only $100 million should go into the stabilization fund. Then the rest will go into the contingency fund. So by his projections, we'll get about $280 million going to the contingency fund in the face of, all, of, of the crisis. Which would then be used to finance the coronavirus alleviation program? Yeah, uh, more or less, because um, the contingency fund um, withdrawals from it are for emergencies. Okay. And there couldn't have been a bigger emergency than what we are experiencing now. This would the minority has said that the finance minister has failed to come to the finance committee, your committee, with the details as to how, as to how this money is going to be spent. Which, which money? The money is... Yeah, the contingency. So the, which sectors, I mean, he said one billion will go into, this is some sort of a stimulus mm, package, mm. will go into hospitality, tourism and, and others. But he's here to provide to the committee an itemized, you know, the list of exactly the areas. I think the minority are running ahead of themselves. There's a two-step process. The first process, which the minister is seeking to do, is to uh, ask Parliament to approve a lowering of the cap, okay. which is before our committee we've worked on it. Uh, there's agreement that the cap be lowered. Now, when the cap is lowered to 100 million, the money now goes into the contingency fund. So, as uh, we speak now, the, man, the, the Parliament has not approved the lowering of the cap. So technically, there's no money going to the contingency fund. Yes. When Parliament, hopefully this evening or sometime tomorrow before the House rises, mm -hmm. approves um, the lowering of the cap, then straight away, as per um, clause um, section 23 of the PRMA, the money moves into the contingency fund. Okay. Now, when the money is going to the contingency fund, the constitution is clear on how monies from the contingency fund can be assessed in Article 1771 of the constitution. So nobody can be demanding a list of uh, for utilization of the proceeds going to the contingency fund because Parliament itself has not approved the lowering of the cap. I, 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 I hope. Yes, uh, it's, it's, it's very clear. Another issue that has come up. You in, in your analysis mentioned the informal sector and how they could be supported in, in, in times like this. There's been the proposition of cash transfers. What, what, what do you make of that? And, and, how, and how would this really work in an economy like ours? Yeah, again, the informal nature of our economy makes this very difficult. If the economy were formalized, we had proper national identification, and we have good data on everyone, then we can segment the the needy in the society who need um, these uh, transfers. But we already have the, uh, uh, the LEAP program, okay. Livelihood Empowerment Against Poverty, which the Ministry of Gender and Social Protection runs. So to start with, we have a fair idea of the, uh, of the very poor. 
then we also uh, uh, they also have data on the aged uh -huh. so that could be a starting point the, the, if uh, the government really wants to seek to make cash transfers they could lease with the the telcos okay. Okay. because these are going to go by mobile money transfers so you lease with the telcos so the data on the poor the aged the vulnerable those who really need help. If, so you start off with the baseline data. I know the Ghana Statistical Service is also helping to um, churn out some good data. Once you have the data and you can get information from the telcos, then at the press of a button, you can make transfers to uh, all, of, all of these people. So I know the Gender Ministry and the National Security and the uh, agencies involved are working on some of these. Those are, those are beyond us. Yeah. Uh, interesting. All right, so uh, we're coming to the end of the interview. It's been a quite an interesting meeting for the Finance Committee. A lot of work has been done. What will be your concluding thoughts? Um, like, uh, as I said earlier, uh, we, we do a lot of work, but uh, we don't sit, uh, uh, we don't have cameras following us, so yeah. you, you might not really know. We advocate that once uh, in a while. Oh, which, oh, I mean, you already do that yeah. sometimes. Um, one of the key um, the things that we worked on was the Customs Amendment Bill, yes. uh, which would facilitate the setting up of automobile uh, um, um, assembling plants. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge. There was a lot of um, opposition to it, but we got it done. Yes. Yeah. And, as usual, we've worked on a number of waivers and the loans that have come in, six hospitals, um, uh, the roads, the water water projects, the, a, a lot has happened. And uh, our work is on the quiet, the, behind the scenes, more or less. So uh, we've done a lot and I think it's been a good meeting. Hopefully Parliament rises tomorrow so that uh, we can also get some rest because it's been it's been it's been tiring times uh, this meeting we want to give your constituents a word you're running again yeah having filed yeah i'm in the race and i'm in the race to win <laughs> so this is my third time trying and uh, on two occasions the, the people of new job himself repose confidence in me to represent them i think i've not been a bad mp and so um Hopefully, April 25th, the majority will give me the nod again. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time. Very, very grateful. Mm -hmm.